here following significant developments in two legal cases informing, inform, involving former President Donald Trump, and both of them are in New York. First, there's a civil fraud case. A new, a new York appeals court cut Trump's bond to $175 million. He previously had until today to come up with nearly a half billion dollars. And then there's his hush money case. A judge has scheduled a trial date for that starting April 15th, rejecting Trump's attempts for further delay. The re presumptive Republican nominee was in the courtroom for that hearing today. This is election interference. They are doing things that have never been done in this country before. We've never had anything like it, certainly not at this level, but we've really had nothing like it that I've been able to find. Robert Costa and Major Garrett join us now. Bob is in New York following that case, and Major is with me here on set. Bob, I want to start with you in New York. So we have this trial date set for April 15th, uh, the first trial of a uh, former president. Um, what reasons did the judge give in this hush money case to uh, start this trial date on this day? Caitlin, great to be with you. It's evident today, based on Judge Juan Mershon's comments inside the courtroom, that he wants this criminal trial of former President Donald Trump to begin as soon as possible. And he largely sided in his statements today with the prosecution, with the Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg, saying that while Michael Cohen, Trump's former fixer, was under federal investigation for several years, that the documents produced as part of that federal investigation were given over to the defense team, the Trump team, in as best a way possible by the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Trump's lawyers have argued uh, in response that that's not true, that they need more time to review all of these federal documents that have come to light as the basis of that federal investigation. But the big picture here is that the judge wants this trial to begin in mid-April. It will begin in mid-April. And when one of Trump's lawyers said today in court that there's still going to be a delay, they're going to try to postpone this, the judge said effectively, I'll see you on April 15th. <laughs> well, that says that. Uh, Major, we know that a legal strategy from mm -hmm. the president's team in all of these cases has been to look for ways to delay these cases. In this case, we have the date. How does that impact Trump's ability to campaign? He's a defendant. He needs to be in the courtroom. When you're a defendant in the courtroom, guess what you're not, Caitlin? You're not a candidate on the campaign trail, whether you're the pre presumptive nominee of a major party or not, as Trump quite clearly is. For this calendar year, Caitlin, former President Trump has won the politics of indictment. It gave jet fuel to his candidacy for the Republican nomination. Many Republican primary and caucus voters who were wondering whether they would support Trump rallied around him around the indictments because they thought he was being treated unfairly. And some forces in American life and law were out to get mm -hmm. Trump. Now he's going to have to live with the reality of an actual trial. Indictments are one thing, a trial is another. And much of what former President Trump can say outside of a courtroom, in between proceedings, has political resonance and relevance. Yeah. All of that resonance and relevance becomes dissipated inside a courtroom because the courtroom is only considered concerned with three things, facts, law, and procedure. Mm -hmm. And in the courtroom, Trump continuously loses on facts, law, and procedure. Mm -hmm. He wins outside the courtroom mm -hmm. when it's an abstraction. Starting April 15th, this case will no longer be an abstraction. It will be a legal reality. This mood that he was in, I mean, he came out afterwards and called all of this election sure. interference. Sure. We know this is not election interference, but how do you assess what he's trying to do here? So that is a typical Trump tactic. I've watched it play out for many, many years, a kind of political jujitsu. Mm. Use the momentum of your opponent to your favor. The former president is, whether you believe the January 6th federal charges are legitimate or not, the most visible figure in all of American political life interfering with the ratification of a presidential election result. No one has tried harder, more publicly and more repetitively, to deny peaceful transfer of power in the history of this country than former President Trump. Mm -hmm. So when he talks about election interference, he's trying to cast all of that blame that rests upon his shoulders mm -hmm. for actions he took intentionally onto some other forces in American political life. Alvin Bragg, the Manhattan District Attorney, it's not his fault that there were hush money payments to Stormy Daniels, Daniels, 
right as the 2016 campaign was reaching its crescendo. Who was in charge of that scheme, according to the documents and the indictment? Michael Cohen and then candidate Trump. When payments were made to a fictitious legal entity created by Michael Cohen when Trump was president, those checks were signed where, Caitlin? In the Oval Office. Is Alvin Bragg responsible for that? No, he's bringing a case based on those facts. The timing of the case is inconvenient for Trump, but the underlying offenses, as alleged, were his doing, not the district attorney's. And we have seen Republicans, you know, co-opt that phrase election interference and apply it blanket to anything that they do. To whatever fits. Exactly. Yeah. A narrative of some forces in American political life's tampering with mm -hmm. the way voters would otherwise judge an election. Yeah. But let's be candid. Voters will judge the 2024 election in part on what mm -hmm. former President Trump did with the 2020 election, mm -hmm. whether he's comfortable with that or not. Mm -hmm. And Bob, you were there. What was the mood like at the courthouse during this hearing and afterwards when Trump talked to the press? I saw Trump up close today inside 40 Wall Street. It wasn't just the courthouse. He had a press conference afterward. And I stood just foot, a few feet away from him and asked him a question about how he's going to pay this bond. He told CBS News he has a lot of cash. He's going to be able to pay this bond, secure it on time. But what was so interesting to me as a political reporter, put aside the legal aspect of all of this, is he spent the first 10 minutes, let's say, of the news conference really outlining his view that he's angry with President Joe Biden, angry with the Justice Department, angry with the prosecutors in lower Manhattan. He's angry with the uh, Attorney General of New York, Letitia James. And his grievances are fueling him politically. And when he was asked by reporters if he believes a conviction in the criminal hush money payments trial could affect him, he, actually, he said it could actually help me. He believes that many Americans will look at this process that he's facing and galvanize or at least be sympathetic toward him. Now, that's a very much TBD prospect politically. It's, it's hard to say any political strategist, red or blue, would want to see their candidate face a conviction during the heat of an election season. But that said... Trump has often used controversy as fuel for his campaigns, which makes him such an unusual political actor on our national stage. And, Bob, I know when you've talked to him before, too, he said that the courtroom is the campaign. That, oh, it is. You know, and, and, and as Major and I were just discussing, according to the timeline here, it very much is going to be where he is and the only place that he can kind of campaign. Um, do you feel like they believe that still works to his advantage or are they kind of internalizing what we were discussing earlier about the realities of what this actually means? It's complicating the political calculus for 2024 because so often we'd be talking about issues like the economy, like the border, like character perhaps to a point. Mm -hmm. But it's Trump's character and conduct that's so front and center due to these ongoing trials and the civil fraud case that it's, it's really pushing to the side so many issues that would usually be cropping up at this point in a general election campaign season. And that could hurt Trump. It could help Trump. It could be a wash. It could be a distraction from the ultimate drivers of what's going to happen in this campaign. But we're in an unsteady political moment where it's so unclear what exactly this all means. If Trump has to pay $175 million, is that a one-week story? Or do people say for the rest of this campaign, the state of New York really believes this, this person's a fraudster and we don't want to have them as president? Or is it just another controversy that circles around Trump? Trump's betting on the latter, but at the same time, the Biden campaign's looking at all of this and saying the January 6th issue, democracy, hasn't even come to the fore yet with Jack Smith. All of these could ultimately be a weight on Trump, but no one's really sure about how it's going to play out because we're not having a traditional campaign. Yeah, not a traditional campaign. The understatement of the 2024 <laughs> campaign, indeed. Um, Bob, thank you very much for sharing your reporting from the scene today. And Major, stick around with us. You'll be yeah, here uh, with much more.